As you're seated this morning, I'm going to open up with uh, a scripture if you want to turn to Psalm chapter number 27. Psalms chapter 27. It's going to be a really simple thought today. It's just close to Jesus. Psalm 27 verses 1 through 3. says, The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. There's a, there's a, a theme here. A, I will not be afraid. I will be confident in my God. Why should I be afraid when I'm close to him? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Before the sun was ever created, God was the source of light. In heaven, there's not going to be any need for the sun. There's not going to be any need for the moon. There's not going to be any need for the stars because Jesus will once again be the only source of light. And when Jesus is in our lives, we do not have to fear darkness. When Jesus is in our lives and when we are close to him, then we will have illumination to the stuff, to the, to the things in our life that might be hidden to us, and we can have illumination shine from us to show forth his light. It's no coincidence that the Lord being our light is tied to the Lord being our salvation. Those things always and forever will be tied together. When we are saved, then the light of God can truly flood our lives. And when we keep our hearts closed tight, when we try and hide the things that are going wrong, when we try and hide our sin, and when we try and hide our emotions so they're not available to others, not only do we harbor the darkness that is inside of us, but we also shut out the light that brings God's peace, the light that brings forgiveness, the light that brings his presence. But when we open our hearts to him, when we repent of our sins, and when we invite him to take residence in our hearts, as difficult and as painful as that can be, being an extremely, extremely painful thing from time to time, especially, especially when you've spent years closing off, and especially when you've spent a long time hiding your heart and your struggles, and your emotions, and your sin. But when we open our hearts, it's like throwing open a door to daylight. Darkness can't resist it. No amount of darkness, regardless of how deep it might look, how vast it might seem, no amount of darkness has ever snuffed out as much as a candle. Even as, as small as like the tea light candles can be, as long as there is illumination, as long as there is a source of light, darkness cannot and will not overtake it. And so how much less of a chance does darkness have against the sun, S-O-N, Jesus Christ? By all appearances, by all appearances, David must have been strong. We know this because he wielded the sword of Goliath, who was a giant. And the Bible says that Goliath's spear was like a weaver's beam. So you can, you can infer then that if, the, if his spear was as a weaver's beam, then the sword was forged or made or created, however you want to word it, in a similar fashion. It would fit the size of this giant. It would be made on a similar scale. So David was a warrior who won battle after battle. He also must have had at least a little bit of a tactical mind because of all the strength the strategies that he was able to put in part, and because he won battle after battle after battle. But in spite of his physical strength, and in spite of his mental acuity, he did not rely on his own ability for safety. He did not rely on his own ability to chase away fear that the battles probably would have very easily bred within him. And instead, while he was literally in the best shape of his life, physically and mentally, David looked to the Lord for all of his strength, and he looked to the Lord for all of his peace of mind. And all too often, we wait until we are weak before we turn to God for strength. 
We wait until we've tried everything else. We wait until we've tried to figure it out ourselves. We wait until we've talked to everybody about it, until we've complained to everybody about it, until we've cried to everybody about it. And as Christians, if Jesus Christ is our strength and our way maker, how often do we actually contradict what we believe? How often do we contradict what we believe when we are depressed, when we are filled with anxiety, when we are filled with doubt and we're down in the dumps and we succumb to our situations and we, we're discouraged before we ever turn to the one who has literally never in the history of existence failed us before. We contradict our beliefs and what we say we believe when we turn to self-help books before we turn to the Word of God. Or we turn to counselors before we turn to Jesus. I wonder what would happen. How much stronger our faith would even be if our first decision was to talk to Jesus before we complained to our friend about it. Or if our first decision was to say, Jesus, I trust you, rather than saying, okay, how can I figure this out without asking people for help? How different would our world be? How different would our walk be? How much more faith would we have because we went to him first instead of a self-help book or a counselor? But when we don't go to him first... God is still in those moments. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 9, the Lord says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, actually this is Paul, therefore will I rather glory in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He's not glorying in his infirmities because he is an amazing person that can withstand everything. He's not glorying in his infirmities because he's got all the solutions already. He's glorying in his infirmities because he gives those, those situations and those infirmities to the one who has never failed him. He's glorying in the infirmities because when he gives up his control, he glorifies God by what happens next. He glories in infirmities to, to, to point that glory back to God. The truth is this. We are never, we are never strong enough to face this world without God. God is not simply a momentary burst of strength. He's not a shot of adrenaline to pick us up when we feel like we're absolutely dead. He's not somebody that we can turn to it, just in this situation when I haven't figured it out and I'm at, my, I'm at my wit's end, at the end of my rope. God, can you help me? And then forget about him. But he is, he is supposed to be the strength for our whole lives. He's supposed to be our comforter for every day. He's supposed to be our counselor for every decision that we make. In Psalm chapter 27 and verse number 1, it simply says, The Lord is the strength of my life. No part of our lives should then therefore be kept separate from him. No part of our lives, can I put it this way, no part of our lives would be better without God being a part of it. They, my time with my family is better because God is a part of it. My, fam, my time with my friends is better because God is a part of it. My time at work is better because God is a part of it. My time on the road driving through town is better because God is a part of it. Because without him, I get angry. Without him, I get frustrated. Without him, I get impatient. Without him, I flip out on people that I have no business flipping out on. And without him, I get road rage like an absolute psycho. But... <laughs> But because I have God with me, if I'm driving down the road and somebody cuts me off, I can say, thank you, Jesus. It's going to be all right. I'm still going to get there safe. Yeah. And if somebody tries to drag race me, thank you, Jesus. It's okay. I'm still going to get there safely. Point blank, without, there, uh, there is no part of our lives that's better without God in it. I dare you. To, I dare you. If you, would, if you would put down a list every moment that you have in your day, from getting up in the morning, getting yourself ready, to going to work, to spending time with your family, everything you do. <coughs> if you would list it, and you would take inventory and say, okay, was God with me here, or was God not with me here? And I bet you, just based on how those situations went, 
You can say whether it would be good, better, or worse without having God be a part of it. We read a few moments ago what David wrote in Psalms 27, verses 1 through 3. He said, whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? My heart shall not fear. In this will I be confident. Now, how could David, being surrounded by enemies literally on every side of him, be so confident? Because God was his light. God was his salvation, and God was his strength. And what God was to us, or was to David, God wants to be to us. If David had been afraid, honestly, if David had been afraid, would we be able to blame him? I wouldn't. Because, listen, I don't know about you, but I've never had somebody try and cannibalize me. Okay? <laughs> I've never had somebody... I've never had armies on every side of me. There are, there are military veterans and all, all the more power to them. But in our regular everyday life, we typically don't have enemies on every side, figuratively or literally. So these sounded like some legitimate bad situations and some legitimate bad guys or enemies. But rather than put emphasis on his situations or more emphasis on his situations, God, or David put more emphasis on who his God was than who his enemies were. He put more emphasis on who his God was than how he was feeling. In Psalm chapter 24 and verse number 7, it says, One thing that I have desired of the Lord, it says that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. The one thing that David desired more than anything else was the presence of the Lord. That's where he felt safest. And that should, it really should not come as a surprise because the safest place for all of us to be is as close as possible to Jesus Christ. Think of the safest place you've ever felt, whether it's in your parents' home, whether it's in, in the arms of a loved one, your spouse or your parents, th think, of, think of all the things that come to your mind when you felt that safety. Confidence in where you were at. Peace, even when all your world is just getting blown up and going psychotic. Hope, even when we felt like there was no hope. All of this is available as much as we could possibly imagine or even want in the presence of God. All of this is available 24-7, 365, when we will walk with Jesus Christ. When we will make it, make it a, an intentional part of our, our lifestyle. Not, I, I, I find it easier for me to walk with him and live with him intentionally when I don't say, I'm going to make an intention to do it every day. I'm going to make an intention rather to live with Jesus I don't know, something about words and the power of how, how we speak is I am going to live with him rather than I'm going to spend every day with him. It just, it, it sounds easier, it feels easier. Most people, most people in, in, in David's time saw the house of the Lord as a place to go on occasion, right? There, three times a year, everybody was expected to go to a feast uh, at the tabernacle. And too many people today still have this mindset. And it can, it, it, it can even come to fruition, I'll say it that way. As those who go to church only occasionally, on special holidays, or for a special event. And even, I, if, if I could say it this way, it can affect us when even the most consistent person who attends, I'll say, worship services regularly, because we're, we are the church, not the building, but who attends worship services regularly, but does not come to service with the desire and the expectation of truly entering into the presence of God. There is a difference when I come to the house of God in my expectation level. If I expect to just go through the motions and get done and go to lunch, or if I expect to meet Jesus where I am going to be. There is a difference there is a difference in the outcome of every gathering that we have. If I say, you know what, let's just get through this. The kids are going nuts. I can't deal with it anymore. Or, in spite of all the stuff that's going on, I expect to meet Jesus today. 
in, the, in, in spite of my kids giving me a run for my money and making me feel stressed, I'm going to meet Jesus today. Because when I meet Jesus, I don't feel so stressed. When I meet Jesus, my kids don't bother me as much. When I meet Jesus, I can pray and it'll be all right because I can deal with it all later. Because I'll have the refreshing of patience and I'll have the refreshing of peace and I'll have the refreshing of joy and I'll have the refreshing of strength when I expect to meet Jesus. When I expect to be in his presence and that, that expectation to be in his presence comes from a birth of a desire to be in his presence. When I was a kid, for, for quite a while, I went to church because I had to. I went to worship services, and I went, sometimes my mom said, you're going, there's no other questions about it, and if you don't, I'm just going to grab you by your ear, and you're going to go anyways. And I knew she would, so I just went. But there, there was a difference Almost immediately, when I switched from I have to go to church to I get to go to church, it, to, to, to maybe sound like a broken record, there are people all over the world that don't have the opportunity that we have to be in the presence of God openly. There are people all over the world who will literally go to prison and be killed if they lift their hands or if they pray in public. And we have the opportunity, not just the opportunity, but the privilege to lift our hands and lift our voices in public and worship the King of Kings in public and glorify Him in public. And can I say this? I, I don't know how many of you have, have uh, how much experience everybody has in attending worship services, but here's the thing. More often than not, if you notice that you actually put effort in, you will get something out. You, you will always get something out of worship service. You will always get something from Jesus. You will always come a, walk away from it feeling better than when you walked in if you will put some effort in and say, again, in spite of my circumstances, I'm going to worship. In spite of my circumstances, I'm going to praise. In spite of how I feel, I'm going to lift my hands. In spite of the weather that's outside because it can affect our mood, I'm going to worship God anyways. Because if nothing else for the simple fact that he is God and he is good. And if he never did anything else for me ever again, he has still done more for me than I could ever ask him for and, and, and it would be okay because I have more than I deserve to have. David, David had a different mindset than the people who would come, come occasionally. His longing, his desire, his yearning was to dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of his life. In, in other words, can I put it this way? He never wanted to be outside of the presence of God. In that way... The story of David encourages us not just to seek God's presence every time we come on a Sunday or a Wednesday, but to seek God every single day of our lives. God is not limited to, and he should not be limited to, the walls that we are sitting in right now. He should not be limited to every time we come on Sunday or on a Wednesday. We literally have the privilege to get a hold of him 24-7, 365, every second of every minute of every hour of every day. If we, if we have that much access to the King of Kings, why would we not take advantage of it? Even if we have just a few minutes driving down the road, why would I not take advantage of saying, Jesus, I love you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for the breath in my lungs. I thank you for the fact that you filled me with the Holy Ghost. I thank you for the fact that I can read my Bible. I thank you for the fact that my family is healthy. All of these different things. In the Old Testament, before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, before the day of Pentecost, the best that David could hope for was to dwell in the temple of God. That was the best he could hope for. But today, by the Spirit, we have the incredible privilege to literally be the temple of God, to have him living inside of us, to have him taking up residence inside of our hearts. It's mind-boggling. That's absolutely mind-boggling that the one who breathed existence 
is living inside of me right now. And we can feel his presence right now. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own. I absolutely never want to take for granted the fact that I can be in his presence literally whenever I want. Literally, we can speak his name and he is there. He's literally as close as the mention of his name. And yet, because I've, I, I can't carve out five minutes in the day, I don't, I'm not in his presence. Because I can't carve out just a few moments outside of my responsibilities and the things that I have to do or the downtime that I want to have, I'm not in his presence. Because I take it for granted because I can pray to him anytime I want. Psalm chapter number 139 and verse number 7, we're going to read all the way through verse number 12. It says, whither, whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the winds of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yes, the darkness hideth not from me, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. I, the fact that I can go anywhere in the world. I, he even says, if I make my bed in hell, you are there with me. If that doesn't bring you comfort, I don't know what will. To, to have the knowledge, to have the certainty that he is with us and for us, literally every single day that we live is absolutely amazing. And the darkness, it says, the darkness hideth not from me, but the night that is around me shines as the day shines. The darkness and the light are the same to him. If, if I can draw a little bit of an analogy, sometimes, sometimes we get to the point where we're like the the security guards at the Sistine Chapel. Because you've got, you've got visitors that come all the time. They crane their necks for the first time that they've ever been able to see all, all the beautiful paintings, all the, all the beautiful artwork. And the guards that are there seem to be completely oblivious to it because the guards that are there are there every single day. It's day in and day out. And so when they, they keep their eyes on the crowd and anytime they think they see a camera, they shout, no photos, no photos. They become so accustomed to the beauty that they do not even notice it anymore. They ignore the glory in favor of simply enforcing the rules because it's taken for granted. Think of all the people in the world who do not know God. Think of all the people that do not have an opportunity or haven't heard about Jesus Christ yet. And yet we still take for granted from time to time the blessedness that we have of having this relationship this, with Jesus, this, this Holy Ghost that inside of us. Besides that, besides all, all the benefits that we've talked about already, the, the awareness of God's beauty is a, source of, is a source of protection in and of itself. Most of the trouble in our lives comes from sin. And most sin, most sin is a result of thinking that what the devil and what the world have to offer is more attractive than what God has to offer. But if we stay close to him and we stay aware of his glory, and we stay aware of his beauty, and we stay aware of his joy and of his peace, everything else will fade into the background because it's going to seem inconsequential. And it's going to seem like it pales in, in comparison to the beauty and the peace that, that comes with knowing God. If you, if you remember the old hymn, it says, the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Nothing else 
can turn our heads as long as we are focused on God's beauty. Psalm 27 and verse 8 says, When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my, my heart said unto thee, Thy Lord, or thy face, Lord, will I seek. Time and time again, when David faced battles, when he faced tragedy, when he faced key decisions, he would call for Abiathar the priest. And David would inquire of the Lord, and the Lord always answered him. He always gave him the right course of action. He always gave him the beneficial decision. Sometimes David was to run and hide. Other times, he was to stand and fight. Other times, he was told to stage uh, um, an ambush. That's the word I was looking for. Stage an ambush from behind the enemy. Seeking and obeying the counsel of God is every bit as much of a source of protection as high walls or body armor. All too often, when we don't seek his face, that decision that we are trying to make becomes that much harder. Because without God, I'm indecisive. Without God, I don't have any peace following any direction. Without peace, I flip-flop from one side to the other. Without God, I can't, I can't commit to anything. And if I do commit to anything, I feel like I'm committing to the wrong thing. So I got to go back and reevaluate the other decision that I was going to make. And then we're going to go full circle 45 more times. But when we, have, when we ask of God, that is protection because we follow peace. And that peace comes from the Holy Ghost. If we're facing trials, if we're facing tragedy, if we're facing tipping points, seek his face and ask him what to do. And then when we've laid the whole situation out before God, take the time and listen to what he says and respond. Because prayer is more than just asking. Prayer is more than just talking and speaking. Since it's communication between Two parties, there are points when we need to listen. But if we're talking the whole time, then we can't listen because, well, we're speaking. And if we're not listening, how do we expect to hear what God is saying? If we never close our mouths enough to just listen to his voice, how do we ever expect to hear? Through, if we keep a, a, a daily awareness of his beauty, if we keep a daily awareness of his presence... And, we, and the fact that we have a constant ability to ask of him, we will find protection in time of trouble. Actually, David likened it to God hiding him in the tabernacle or setting him upon a rock. Psalm 27 and verse number 5 says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Jesus, he told a parable once of a man who dug deep and, and built his house upon a rock. And he said, anybody who would, who would listen to these teachings or heard the teachings and acted on them would be like that wise man who built his house upon the rock. When the storms came, when the floods rose, when the rain came, the house stood firm. Just as tra tragedy and troubles and storms will come in our lives even if, even if we are Christians. But the difference is in the man who built his life on Jesus' words stood while the man who disregarded Jesus' words collapsed in calamity because if you're familiar with it or even if you're not, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And so if the sand gets wet, the house is going to come tumbling down. We thank God that he pulls us out of sin. We thank God that he pulls us out of the miry clay, as another old hymn says, and that he puts our feet on the rock. Him. He is our rock. But then if, after he puts our feet on the rock, if we will stay in his word, and if we will stay on that rock, and if we will stay in obedience to him, and if we will stay in his presence, then our house will stand firm when the winds blow and the storms come. Psalm chapter 27 and verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord, which is a terrible word for most of us. Nobody likes to hear the word wait. If we have to wait for more than five minutes in a fast food drive-thru, 
it is a terrible experience. If our popcorn takes more than a couple minutes in the microwave, we're tapping our feet, checking our phones, scrolling through whatever social media we have. It is rare to find a patient person. And oftentimes this comes through in our prayer life because we go to prayer once, we go to prayer twice, we go to prayer three times. All right, hit me with it, God, yes or no? There's no room for any other response. But sometimes God has a third answer, answer which is simply wait. His timing, just like his strength, is perfect, even in the waiting. He's not idle. And in the waiting, he strengthens our hearts. He says, wait, because we might not be strong enough yet. He says, wait, because we might not be prepared enough yet. He says, wait, because we might have some things in our lives that we need to reprioritize before we take that next step. He says, wait, when we want to jump, because maybe if I jump now, I'm going to die rather than waiting and letting him prepare the way for me. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. His timing is just as perfect as his strength. His timing is just as perfect as his, me, as his mercy. His timing is just as perfect as his grace. His timing is just as perfect as his love. And when we learn to seek him daily we will find that in that waiting time, we will find peace. And we will have peace because we know that there is a reason for the wait. There is a reason that, we are, that he's not saying just go. And he, it, it, even if you feel like you don't, haven't heard yes, no, or wait, find your pastor and your pastor will be able to give you direction on yes, no, or wait. And we will, when we run to his presence, when the storms begin to rage... I'll rephrase that. When we learn to seek God daily and when we find that his presence becomes a refuge, we are already used to running to him in the storms because we've already done it and we've already made a practice. So we, we're not already discouraged. We're not already depressed. We're not already doom and gloom. We're just ready to say, okay, God, this is difficult. I don't get it, but you got it. They don't, I don't want to be away from his presence. I don't, I don't know about you, but I want to be in his presence as, as much as I possibly can on a, day, on a daily basis. Because in his presence, there is fullness of joy. And in his presence, there is peace that passes my understanding. There is peace that passes my brain accuracy. In his presence, there is safety. In his presence, there is security. In his presence, there is wonder. In his presence, there is strength. In his presence, I can find every answer. I can find every solution. I can come up to any situation and not worry about it. In his presence. As, we, as I get ready to wrap up, let's all stand this morning. And it I'll just ask it this way. Is it okay if we just spend some time in his presence this morning? We have, can, can I tell you that we have time to worship him? We have time to praise him. We have time to thank him for what he's done. We have time to be with him. Can we just welcome his presence into this place again and, and, and get in the presence of God? Jesus, you are so good. You are so wonderful in all of your ways, God. You have, you have blessed us with so much more than we could ever think. You've blessed me. You have given me blessings that I cannot comprehend. You have filled me with your spirit. You have filled me with joy, God. And I am just thankful to be able to be in your presence. I'm thankful, God, to be able to call on your name in my time of need. I'm thankful that I can go to your word and find direction for my life. I'm thankful, God, to be with like-minded people of faith. I'm thankful, Lord, that I can lift my hands hands and I can lift my voice and worship my king regardless of who's around. I can praise you not because, not to make myself look good, but I can praise you because you're worthy, because you're holy, because you're righteous, because you're glorious, because you're wonderful and magnificent and majestic in all your ways, God. You are resplendent. I exalt your name, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. I give you glory and honor and praise to day because you are worthy.
Hallelujah. It is, I, I can't tell you, there are no words to, to, that I can use to express how thankful I am to be able to be in his presence. Amen. Thank you for coming out today. There's refreshments downstairs, and we'll be back up at 11 to jump into worship service. You're dismissed.